Good afternoon, good night, good day, <laughs> everyone, wherever you are around the world, wherever you're watching this from, um, I greet you and I hope that you'll enjoy what's coming next. Today we have the one and only, the greatest, Lodi Dalziel, that's going to be uh, sharing with us a little bit about her entrepreneurial story. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Lodi not that long ago, I must say. It was maybe three months ago, maybe a little bit more. No, I think uh, about three months. Maybe, maybe a little bit over three months uh, when she applied to be a TEDx speaker. We had a lot of, whole lot of fun working on, on her TED Talk. And then um, luckily for us today, it was published on the TEDx um, YouTube channel. So go check it out. We can share it. Uh, so Lottie here is a TEDx speaker, but she's not here to talk to us about that. She's here to share with us a little bit about her entrepreneurial story, how she became a social entrepreneur and a socially responsible environmental entrepreneur and everything she wants to share with us. So good afternoon, Miss Lottie. How are you today? I am great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, yeah, no, I'm excited to kind of share a little bit more about the behind the scenes of how I got to what I'm to be doing what I'm doing and I love my job and I love what I do every day so I want to help inspire people to do the exact same amazing amazing so uh without further ado I'll just leave it to you I know that you have a little bit of a presentation um and and for everyone else the way that we're going to run is uh, the run this is uh put your questions in the chat uh, we'll have a Q&A, a pretty long Q&A, I guess, by the end of her presentation. I'm going to ask Lottie a few questions from uh, that, that I know a lot of our students at, at the Academy of Entrepreneurs would really love to ask and, and they would like to know a little bit more about the challenges of being an entrepreneur. How does she do it pretty much on her own? But she's going to tell us a little bit more before. So feel free to put your questions in the chat. And, uh, and it, now it's all yours so um yep I'm great gonna mute myself. okay uh, mr gerardo i'm gonna i'm gonna mute you as well i'm gonna mute myself and i'm gonna try and work out how to present without killing us all so let's see if i go to there and then oh no lucas so what's going on that's all right do i present then share or share present then share present let's see how we go and then how do i get out of it to present to you all though that that's the tricky part ah that is the tricky part miss thais where are you that you're there in the car having a blast in, in the middle of the <laughs> beach <laughs> just to go out of the delivery because the delivery closed if we stay in the car Amazing. Perfect. Staying in the car is great. Uh, could okay. you manage to do it? No. Can I, if I just share it, will it just show my Canva? Give it a go and I'll let you know what's the I'll worst thing that can happen. That. Share, share a screen. I'm going to share with you this one. Great. Can you all see that? Yes. But now you can, if you give it a go and you present it. Standard. We there get to we see go. Perfect. Can, yes. you see, can you see your little faces as well, or is that just me? Yes, we can all see our faces as well. Aren't you lucky? Okay, so <laughs> hello, everybody. For somebody who spends most of their day on a computer or on their phone, I'm just great at this kind of screen sharing or what have you, but we made it through and we are all here. Um, as Lucas just introduced me, I am Lottie. I am the founder of Banish, firstly, which is an online store and education platform that helps people reduce their waste. And then I have just released a new brand, which is called Little Pepino, which is a brand of sustainable kitchen products. So today I'm just pretty much going to talk you guys through how I got to where I am today. Um, my journey, a little bit of a background on me because it isn't really that conventional and that entrepreneurship-like. Um, and then hopefully you can all walk away with 
some tips and tools and I don't know, be inspired, feel like you can go and do it yourself. Or if you've got any questions, as Lucas said, please ask me absolutely anything. Um, I am always here to help. I feel like when I started my journey, I had so many amazing people that gave me so much feedback and so much constructive criticism or advice or just kind of were there to support me. So I want to do the exact same for you guys. So let's see. Bef my Oh, there we go. It's My background is not in authentic gemstone earrings, bracelets and more. Let's just firstly put that there. Um, my background is as a journalist. I was a journalist at Women's Health and Men's Health magazine um, down in Sydney. I worked there for about four years or three and a half years I worked at Women's Health and Men's Health um, running all of their digital platforms so their websites social media kind of video content everything like that um, I was initially employed on InStyle magazine and kind of worked my way up to managing a team of seven there whilst I was doing that though we kind of did a lot of articles where we would kind of I don't know, try crazy health trends like juice cleansers and I don't know, squatting a hundred times a day and see what happens if we got Kim Kardashian foodie or something like that. And one of the articles that I was assigned to write was Mark Wahlberg's daily routine. And I don't really know how many of you guys know what Mark Wahlberg's daily routine is but pretty much he wakes up at 4 a.m he prays he meditates he works out for about two hours then he starts work so pretty much he just wants to get the most out of his day by waking up early so I thought okay well I can do that for a week I can wake up at four o'clock in the morning so I woke up I'm not religious I tried meditating I was terrible at it and I kind of was going, well, what am I meant to do at four o'clock in the morning? If I work out for two hours, I will physically decompose. So that cannot happen. So I was just sitting there. So I was like, okay, great. Well, I'll do some online shopping <laughs> as you do. Um, and it was in February. And one of my New Year's resolutions had been to do better when it came to sustainability. I wasn't really sure exactly what that meant, but I just knew that I probably wasn't being as environmentally conscious as I wanted to be. And I knew kind of from the news headlines that were coming out that you needed, we all needed to be doing something more, but I wasn't really exactly sure what that was. So I was like, great, I'm going to go and I'm going to find the best straw. And I wasn't really sure I knew plastic straws weren't great. And I looked into it and I was like, hang on. There's bamboo straws, stainless steel straws. There are straws made from pasta. There are silicon straws. What straw is meant to be the best for me and for the environment? So I did all of this research at four o'clock in the morning. And eventually I was like, okay, cool. So stainless steel straw is going to be the best one for me after trawling through all of these sites. Anyway, so I ordered the stainless steel straw online. It came the next day and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. And each and every individual straw was individually wrapped in plastic. And I kind of went, well, what is going on here? What is the point of having, of me trying to reduce my waste and trying to be more sustainable if after so hours of research on finding the best straw, which is such a simple thing, I just got more plastic. And I kind of went, well, this isn't, like, this is frustrating. It's disheartening I kind of thought that I was doing the right thing but it, I just feel like I was really hurting the planet even more and it kind of just kind of sat there and ground on my ears meanwhile I was waking up at four o'clock every single morning to do absolutely nothing so I just kept on researching and I kept on trying to find out information and the harder I searched the harder I found it was to actually find credible information around waste and every day I was breaking down health and fitness myths and I was helping people live healthier and I was kind of helping them understand what calories are and I don't know what the keto diet is and all of this kind of stuff, but there just wasn't the same out there for sustainability. And I kind of went, well, hang on. If we want people to live more sustainably, then we need them to, we need them to, it needs to be so easy that there's no reason for them not 
to reduce their waste. So in, I'd identified my problem and then I created the solution. So the solution for me was to create a platform that helped provide the tools, which those tools are not only physical tools as in the actual products um, that were helping people reduce their waste, but actually giving them the credible information for people out there who haven't been living like this forever, who just want to do one or two three things. They don't want to flip their lives. They don't want to never ride, never drive in their car again, but they want to do something. So that was what made me think of Vanish. And it was in having conversations and kind of doing all of my research, I found some amazing suppliers. I found amazing brands that did embody sustainability. They were packaging their products without any plastic. None of their products contained palm oil. None of them contained parabens. For them, it was easy, but they were so small and so grassroots, they had no way of marketing themselves to a mass platform and to get their goods and their services out there to large audiences, which was something that I did each and every day. So it just really, for me, made sense where I had this problem and then I just had this easy, simple solution. One of those things that you kind of go, why doesn't shipping come without plastic? Like it's just so, so simple. So that's how I started. That's how I kind of thought of the idea. And then being the mass marketer that I am, I thought, well, if you're going to launch, you have to have a great date to launch on. So lucky for me in Australia, we have a day called Clean Up Australia Day, which is quite famous. And it happens on the 1st of March every year. And people just get out there and they just grab a bag or a bucket or what have you, and they just pick up rubbish. So that was coming up in two weeks time. So and great. I'm going to launch on Clean Up Australia Day. So from identifying the problem, I thought of the solution. Then I contacted and pitched to these new businesses that I found after research that were doing the right thing. And then I built the website, wrote the content, started social media, got it all up, and then I launched it. So it's probably quite unique for an entrepreneurship story to kind of have an idea and launch two weeks later. But for me, I was waking up at 4 a.m., so I had plenty of time. But also I've known from starting businesses in the past, this was my, I think my fourth business that I started, that it doesn't need to be perfect in order to start. And I knew that by starting, I was then able to tweak and modify and find out what was working, what wasn't working. And that was going to be the easiest and the quickest way to do that. So I launched, it wasn't huge. I didn't have tens of thousands of dollars worth of sales in the first day, months, weeks. But it, what it did is it allowed me to kind of then connect with other people to show people an actual prototype, show them something that was working, start building, start building that community to then go out and get more businesses and pitch and kind of get more people involved. involved. Because I don't know about you guys, but if I look at a website and I see that they've got 10 social media followers and they might have 10 products. I'm probably going to think it's a scam and I'm going to get, just walk away. But in order to build on that, you just have to start and you just have to start growing it. So for me, my biggest learnings in being an entrepreneur, which launching Vanish was what, March 2018, so about two and a half years ago, it is to aim for progress, not for, for perfection. Oh gosh, my words for perfection. And for me, that has been really difficult. It's been really, really hard because I am a perfectionist by nature, but by looking for progress and being completely transparent, it has allowed me to really learn fast and to actually get to actually make more ground and cover more things because rather than working and slaving away on something and making it absolutely perfect, I'm able to launch see how it goes, then adapt and move and keep on going. Um, another thing, actually, that's what I wanted to show you actually is, so this is the website when I first launched in 2018. So you can see there it that beautiful logo I designed on Canva, which is very budget. 
I pretty much built everything from scratch. I just took a screenshot from one of those websites today, which is why some of the video, the pictures have gone. But all of those photos are stock images. It was all all over the place, but it worked. All of the links were there. It was kind of clear. It kind of had some colors in it. It was working. And then today we can look at what the website looks like a bit more now. I couldn't really screenshot it. There is so much more in there. There are so many more sales. It looks like an e-commerce website. I've still got the education there, but you really can buy from it, which wasn't really there to start with. So I think that was probably for me, one of the biggest things, biggest learnings was to just start. It was like the other day, maybe a couple of weeks ago, we launched a recycling program with Banish. And it was such a huge, big lead up to launch this product and this new offering. And I was so stressed about it. And I was going, hang on, why am I so stressed about it? It's realistically speaking, launching this program, I'm not going to be flooded with recycling. I'm not going to be flooded with kind of garbage bin trucks filled with recycling but what I can do is I can launch and then I can talk about it and I and it was through talking to people it was where I got the questions from people it was from talking to people that I was able to then find out okay what are the types of things they will be recycling how can I kind of structure this who out of the audience that we've got will actually participate in this program and how can I target all of my communication strategies to them so I think that was a really valuable program, valuable learning. I didn't actually have a name for it until afterwards when I put a call out to kind of ask for people to help for a name. And then I still thought of the name, but it was kind of by brainstorming and seeing everybody else participate that kind of helped me come up with that name and to get creative with it. So I think that kind of ties in quite nicely to your community being your biggest commodity. And I think the TED talk that I just did with Lucas was on the power of community and fighting climate change. It's something that I feel very, very strongly about. But for me to stand out on social media, to stand out as a business, it has been about embodying community. It's been about getting everybody involved. It's about replying to people and helping them recycle better. That doesn't have any monetary benefit for Banish. It doesn't help banish in any way shape or form but it does help our planet which is the aim and it does help build that sense of community we've run beach cleanups before covid which again weren't heavily banish branded they were just about people getting involved and getting out there and i think for me that's one of the biggest things at the moment is as a business owner you need to be feeling like you are a part of a community as a consumer because there are so many different brands out there. In my field alone, there used to be kind of three or four. Now there's probably about three or 400 people doing exactly what Banish, or not exactly what Banish did, but very having a very similar offering. And in order to stand out, what we have is our community. We have the people who want to come, who want to learn, who want to ask questions, who are happy to share all about our social media and all about our recycling program on their own personal Instagram feeds. And I think building that following has been completely, I don't know, invaluable. Like you can't put a monetary figure on having those brand champions who no matter what you put out, they will help you and they will contribute because I am a solo founder. I am, it is just me. I've got somebody that helps me out a couple of days a week, but generally speaking, it is just me. And it gets to the point of the day when you have made every single decision from kind of what colored safety razor to a different photo on a landing page to new social media, to dates, to, I don't know, content calendars, the, sometimes the last thing you want to do is make more decisions because you just get complete decision fatigue. But I find in talking to the community, I'm actually empowering them to feel like they're a part of the journey, but it's also really valuable and helpful to me as well. Um, not saying to use them like employees, but just they are great at helping with decision making as well. So I think for me, that's been really valuable. And I think being able to as well, 
for them to have somebody to relate to, to have a face, to have something that's very real. And because when I'm going on this journey, I still do use plastic. I drive my car, I fly when I can. And it is realistic. And I think that really helps with them is rather than having just a logo or a color or kind of a graphic, having a person for people is so much more valuable. It is just so it's just an an amazing tool because you can relate, you can build that connection, which I think is often quite difficult to build as brands. And then my third biggest learning would have to be being comfortable. Here's some of my community. Um, The third one would be being comfortable with the uncomfortable. And I think particularly as entrepreneurs, it is quite easy to kind of get set in your ways and you kind of know your strengths you know what you're good at you know where you're going and it's so easy to kind of have your eye on the prize but not really look up not look around not push yourself and it is scary and the failure rates of entrepreneurship are extremely high but what you can do is you can try. And I think we need to actually put, instead of we need to flip the statistics on their head and rather than saying, I don't know, X percentage of businesses failed in the past two, in the first two years, it needs to be something about like 10, one in 10 Australians are entrepreneurs. Isn't that amazing? Like we need to be hearing the fact that people have a go, that they push themselves, that they're out there trying because I think that is so much more valuable than people actually give credit for. And I think it is about pushing yourself. I just wrote an art, a post on Facebook about the fact that I did a TEDx talk. I'm not, an, I'm not anything, I'm not an innovator. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert in any specific field. I call myself a sustainability expert, but that is because I purely know a lot about recycling. It's not because I have an environmental engineering degree or a master's of sustainability. And I think the whole thing about this is about pushing yourself because I saw, I think it was Juan's, um, TEDx the call out on LinkedIn saying oh apply if you want to be a TEDx speaker and I was going great that's been on my mood board for kind of years and years and just kept on scrolling and I went hang on why wouldn't I try why wouldn't I just submit my idea and see because I think you really just have to put yourself out there being an entrepreneur is like riding a very very scary roller coaster there are so so many highs followed by so 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 many lows and just when you're in a low all of a sudden you shoot right back up again but I think you need to you need to keep on evolving you need to keep on pushing yourself it's like for example like we've got a really great engaged following on Instagram who I love and I'm kind of on Instagram all day just talking to people and kind of getting and building that community and this thing came along called TikTok and I went oh no it's fine I've got my little Instagram community my Facebook community so why would I try anything else like it's you don't want to spread yourself too thin you just want to work on I don't know one social media platform and then my friend well now business partners of Little Pepino said to me he said just give it a try just have a go like why not and here I am now creating one TikTok a day, getting out there. And I've almost got more TikTok followers than I have on Instagram in the space of a couple of months. So it just kind of shows that sometimes you need that nudge from somebody else to kind of give it a go and to try, but it is being vulnerable and it is putting yourself out there. And you really don't know unless you try, you really just need to get out there. It's about when that, when COVID wasn't happening, I had a personal goal for myself to go to one event a week and that event could be a new yoga session it could have been a entrepreneurship kind of I don't know mingler or mixer or whatever you call it because it was about meeting people and getting out there and kind of making connection with other entrepreneurs or other people who are just in the industry or just interested and curious to kind of find out more because it's in talking to people that I don't know, you get so much feedback from people who aren't necessarily in your circle. They're not your cheerleaders who no matter what you say, you'll fall over and they'll go, good work. That was great. You often need those people who you've never even met before to kind of say, but how are you going to monetize that? Have you thought about doing X? 
I actually know such and such who has done that and tried, but he then fell on to this and this actually does work. And I think that's really, really important as well. So I think we don't really sugarcoat it. Entrepreneurship isn't sugarcoated. Everybody knows that it's hard, but I think what the most beneficial thing to, for me has been is just to keep on going and to just when you think you're comfortable, it's to go, okay, no, no, it's, we don't want to be comfortable. We need to be uncomfortable and to keep push it, pushing it. So we can all come back and we can ask lots of questions. For me, my, big, my three biggest challenges are perfectionism, competition and time. So perfectionism, I mentioned this before. I love everything to look pretty. I love everything to be tied up in a neat bow and I would love to just kind of finish that, move on completely. But that is not something that you can do as an entrepreneur because you need to be completely always evolving, always changing, always kind of moving on. So for me, that has definitely been a very personal um, a personal struggle or a challenge, I would say. Um, also, it is competition. As I mentioned, when I started, there was only a couple of people doing something similar in the, in the sustainability space. Now there are hundreds of people who are jumping on a trend to be, to be a, bit, a brand in this kind of trendy sector. So I think that's been really difficult for me as a person who is funding their lifestyle, their livelihood with a business and without funding, without kind of anything to then have these people who come in with bucket loads of money, with bucket loads of staff that is really, really difficult. But again, I think community is something that you can't pay for. It's that kind of relationship with people is something that you can't really compete with. So I think I'm very fortunate in that aspect. And then my other challenge is time. And I think everybody kind of struggles with this, but it is so hard to juggle it all and go from doing so so many different hats each and every day I have got somebody who helps me out um, from kind of an administration level eight eight hours a week but that really barely skims the surface and if anything it doesn't free up my time it doesn't mean that I can go to the beach for an extra eight hours a week but it does mean that I can focus on those bigger bigger strategies and I don't know more um, important tasks because I think for me what's really really valuable and something that I try and think of every day is I try and think of my hourly rate when I'm doing a task and it's really hard because sometimes it like being a bootstrapped business you are everything's so lean and I just want to do it all because then I'm obviously saving money but it comes down to the point where you're going okay I'm say my hourly rate is $50 an hour and I'm doing a task that is probably could be done by somebody for $20 an hour then this isn't a good use of time because I could outsource this and I could then be working on those bigger better goals that actually do make the business money because when you're in that startup and that infancy stage there are so many nice to haves but realistically speaking you only have limited amount of time limited amount of money so you need to do the things that will make you money I'm not saying that you should be cutting corners on packaging and throwing in bubble wrap here there and everywhere definitely that um, is a no-no but when it comes to kind of what you decide to do during your day three quarters of it has to come down to making the business money because if it's not, if it's all the fluffy stuff about, I don't know, making the website look even prettier and changing headers and stuff like that, that's not really going to make you money and you won't stick around for much longer. So I think that's really, really important. It's kind of looking at your to-do list and, well, for me, I'm a big list person and really going through and making everything about making money, which sounds ridiculous for a socially sustainable entrepreneur or whatever Lucas calls it, but it is really, really important because in order to be a sustainable business, you actually have to be around for a long time. You have to be sustainable as a business yourself. And I think 
the sustainability sphere is more expensive in some in some areas because I don't know compostable satchels are not cheap using no sticky tape is again is not cheap there are so many little things that are hidden costs that people don't think about and they think because it's sustainable then it should just cost the exact same amount but just be sustainable that's what the consumer assumes whereas it as realistically speaking as a business owner it's a lot more expensive there's a lot more thought that has to go behind it you can't just shop around for I don't know the best wi-fi um, supplier and kind of move on you have to look for one that is actually like where are all of your so your um, files stored? Is it on a carbon neutral cloud? There are so many different things to think about, which do take up so much time. So I think that's, again, another thing about being um, sustainable, which I haven't really touched. I feel like this talk's been mostly on entrepreneurship, but when it comes to sustainability, it's about doing your research and it's about being transparent and I think what I'd love to see from more businesses is more transparency in where they're at when it comes to sustainability. I don't want to see any more press releases from a fast fashion e-commerce um, retailer saying that they've moved to compostable shipping satchels. What I would love to see from them is a kind of a bit more of a plan about how they're going to improve their working conditions over the next five years and what they're doing in terms of the materials that they're using. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it would just be great for them to acknowledge the fact that they are working on it because get using sustainable materials or kind of trans, um, moving their policies and their different structures, it does take time and it does take a lot of, there's a lot of costs involved, but I would love it for businesses to be more transparent with that and to actually acknowledge the fact that they're just trying to do better rather than kind of putting out this postcard of how they're absolutely amazing in one facet of their business. So I think that is definitely something that I would like to see more of. I'm trying to think, Lucas, have you got a bazillion questions for me? I do have a bazillion questions for you. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, and there's there's quite a few questions as well in the chat. We have a lot of people live on Facebook. We had a lot of people here as well. Uh, so whenever you want to wrap it up, uh, yeah, I'm happy it'd be just nice to, to start some sort of discussion. Yeah, I think let's just start the discussion because I feel like I'm just kind of rambling, but I'd love to know what's kind of most relevant to people Amazing. listening. Perfect. Uh, do you, so I know, do you want to share a little bit more about your, how people can contact you? Because I, I think it would be great to stop sharing and see your faces yeah, kind of no worries. full size, but yeah, Again, yeah, so as I just mentioned, there are a lot of ways that you guys can get in touch with me. Um, Instagram is probably, if you want to have a DM or a kind of a personal, a private conversation, I'd probably go to Instagram. If you want to see all of the fun stuff that I'm doing on TikTok, then I would definitely recommend that or just kind of look at it from a marketing perspective. TikTok is really cool. Or again, people can email me or find me on LinkedIn as well. I'm pretty responsive across all of the above, pretty much. Amazing. So whenever you want to stop sharing, I'm going to take the lead. I have a few questions that I want to ask you before right. I let everyone let just come up and ask them. Get out with that. I think I can. I think I can take control. Oh, there you go. Awesome. What's going right. on? I'm, I'm, there we go. I'm, there's there's so many people. Under. When I was there doing is. it, I could only see there was only three of you. And I was like, oh, ah, I no, but, but there is, there is, there is. So, um, Zoti, thanks, thanks so much for sharing. Um, and again, I'm guessing everyone has a lot of questions, even more than the ones that they posted. But I need to ask a few things because uh, you you kind of, you hit the spot on, on a few concepts that we really kind of, um, I don't know what's the word, but it could be something like uh, we really we would really support from uh, from from AE, and it's something that we really try and spread out. Um, and that is, you started saying something really interesting, which is, I found the problem, or I really understood the problem first and came up with a solution. So I want to ask you, in terms of an entrepreneur, because uh, we really value this concept of really trying to understand what is the problem you're solving. How did you come across that? concept or is it something that was very obvious to you uh that is, is is this something that you learned along the way that identifying and solving a problem is super important when coming up with a business 
Yeah, it was pretty much just a personal problem. I was really selfish and I just wanted to be more sustainable and it was really hard. And when I couldn't do it, I just wanted to create it. So I don't think I was really, I wasn't hunting for a new business. At the time I was running a different business. Mm. Um, but when I found this problem, it was one of those things that are just, it's so simple. It just kind of hits you straight in the face and you kind of go, well, I just need to fix this. Good. That's great. Um, the, the second thing that, that I took notes from and that I loved is, is this idea of, of, of the lean methodology, right? It doesn't need to be fer- perfect. It just needs to be out there. So you said uh, you started building this yourself. And I, I can see um, Renata that was asking you if, if yeah, that first website, it was someone that actually did it for you or if you did it yourself. No, so um, all of the websites have just been built through Shopify. So I just use all of the free themes on Shopify. I haven't paid anybody or self-taught. anything like that. Was it 100% self-taught? I mean, did you yep. watch YouTube videos or it was just natural of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and see they're, how this they're works? Pretty, they're pretty good. All I find personally the Shopify themes are pretty easy. They're pretty much just like big blocks and you just throw them in but in saying that like you saw the first website and you see it now and the website the home page in particular I'm constantly changing I use a lot of heat mapping so I'll kind of use these apps that help tell me where people are actually clicking when they come to the website yeah. so then I can kind of look around and go okay, actually so when they go to the navigation bar at the top they actually really they always click on kitchen so that's why on the home page now the kitchen is the main feature because that's where people want to go and the thing is with when you're driving people especially because we do do paid campaigns through social media and they hit that home page we have got seconds not minutes seconds to capture their attention so that home page just needs to be optimized to the nth degree so that there is no reason for them to bounce off and to go somewhere else so I think that's why I'm constantly changing it because I'm trying to get it perfect and then you think you've got it perfect and then all of a sudden people are leaving too quickly and going no come back please come back longer my bounce rate (laughs) uh the power of metrics I mean it's so important to understand especially when you have already something running to really understand what's going on uh, in your website. So uh, do you use Google Analytics? Is that your main source yeah. of, of, of metrics? Yes, I use Google Analytics a lot. I Again, when I was a journalist, we used Google Analytics, but not from an e-commerce perspective. We used it very much to kind of see how many people were reading different articles. So it was a little bit easier because I had that leg up, but... Google Analytics is like a gold hole. It's like you could just deep dive in there and you find out so much never amazing ending. information. Yeah, it's great. Just On my to-do ending. list for the past kind of like three years has been to do the Google Garage courses, but it just hasn't happened yet. But I keep on recommending them to other people, but I just haven't awesome. done them myself. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Um, I have, I have, a, a, I mean, a few other questions or a few other things that I would like to highlight, but um a lot of the, the of our students or, or people that are in our community always really struggle with with the names, the names of their businesses. Um, in, in just a, I know, in, in a few seconds, how did you come up with yours? Uh, is it something that you really struggled with? What we try and preach at the academy is the name doesn't really matter. You build upon the name, and then and and then whatever you build upon it is. It's how good the name's gonna be. I always go with the same with the same example. Uber, Uber is the shittiest. I'm sorry, it's a really <laughs> bad name, but it makes a lot of sense now for us because we've been hearing it for so long that it's just it's in our brains. So yeah. How did you come with yours? And again, and I think Little Pepino is is an amazing name. So put on that. Yeah. One. So the name Banish. I was actually so lucky. Bless my mom. I called her like after my 4 a.m. wake up, and I was like. I'm not going to work today because I've just thought of the best business ever. And she was like, okay, calm down and just go to work with you. And I was like, okay. But anyway, I'll tell you on my way to work about my idea. And I was telling her about it. And I was like, but I just need to think of a name. And I was like, I don't want it to include the name. I don't want it to include eco. I don't want it to include sustainability or green or anything like that because that's just greenwashing in itself. 
I was like, I just want it to be so simple and easy because this is going to be a household name. And she was like, okay, cool. And I just went to work anyway. And then about an hour later, I swear, I just get this text from her being like, banish. And it just made complete sense. It was like, banish plastic, ban rubbish. Like it just was so simple, so easy. I couldn't get the dot com, which I think now I get a lot of people being like, oh, you don't have the dot com, like you can't go international. But the whole thing with banish is from a carbon perspective, I don't want to sell internationally. I don't want to ship things internationally. I want to hero Australian businesses. So I think just having the .com.au is fine. And I've got the .org and .au and I've got the .net.au. I've got everything AU that you possibly can have. Um, And then with Little Pepino, actually, my business partner and I had a massive brainstorming session because we knew what we were creating. We knew we were creating sustainable kitchen products and household items, but we just couldn't think of a name. And we kind of had this late night where we had the whiteboard out and we were just kind of throwing things down. And one of us was on GoDaddy trying to work out because he's so like, have to have the .com, have to have the .com, which is like impossible nowadays. Anyway, and then we couldn't get it to anything that we both were happy with. So we were like, okay, anyway, we'll call it. Have a, have a good night. See you later. And he's a massive nerd in a great way. Love them. They're perfect. Love nerds. Anyway, and he went home and he watched a documentary. And the documentary that he watched was about this octopus. And this octopus was called Little Pepino. And the whole reason behind this octopus in this documentary was talking about how amazing octopuses are. And octopuses have evolved more than any other animal in the world. And they don't learn from their parents. They learn from their surroundings. And they kind of look around and in a couple of days, they can kind of, I don't know, the water temperature can change and then they can change. Or in a couple of seconds, a predator can come and they can change not only the way that their skin looks, but the way that it feels and it touches. And they're just absolutely amazing. So he just messaged me and he said, we have to name the brand after this little Pepino because it just made so much sense. The .com was available and it just worked really. So yeah, that's that's how we got the names. That's so good. Okay, I have two more things and then I'll, I'll leave it up to everyone. I don't want to take your the whole time or the whole remaining time. But there was something, uh, th- there is one question that I, I did want to ask you and uh, that you weren't really addressing, which is, was there a time that when you, when you said like, I, I, I'm going to quit, this is over, I cannot make it, being a, a solopreneur is very hard. Uh, this is too much, too much of a hustle. Uh, it's been, it's been a year and I'm still not, not self-sustainable. Did you, did you have that like tipping point at some point? Honestly, I just love it. I love it so much. I have not thought about throwing in the towel or quitting ever. I just wake up every day and I just want to keep going even on the weekends, which I'm trying not to do as much. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> Um, and the last one before I, I jump into the chat comments is, um, and I just want to highlight this, but this idea of having an hourly rate and understanding how much is your hour worth. And obviously there comes a time where you probably cannot, even if it's a five or $10 thing that you think you're doing, maybe you can't afford it because you don't have that disposable income or, or you have the time, but you don't have the money. But it's it's I think that's an incredibly smart way of of saying I can do, I should be doing this or somebody else should be doing that especially in the stage that you are now. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that for, for whoever's um, listening to us right now. So Lodi, thank you very very much. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into the comments first, and then I'm just gonna let everyone ask questions out loud. So Renato is talking about the website i think renata that is that is clear she said that uh, she did it herself which is amazing um it, it, do, do you want to add anything to that renata or or is that the question that you had i can see her face here so maybe she wants to do it herself uh did you have experience building a a spot for, um shopify, shopify. <laughs> a website um, so I'd built one previously, but it was really simple. The one that I'd built previously was for a brand that had four products. And when Banished launched, it had 
10 suppliers and 40 products. So it was, and it had the whole educational side of things. So it was a bit of a different build, but again, it was just about kind of, it's pretty intuitive. Well, I think it's pretty intuitive Shopify. Like personally, I did have a trial on Wix as well, but for me, I don't need the coding side of things. I, I can do like the tiniest amount of code, but I really don't need anything that special. So it was just a bit kind of you're playing around. Okay. Uh, can I ask my next question? Uh, uh, when no. You, okay, yeah, when did you found it? <laughs> when was the launch? Which year? How, how long was um, 2018, it? 2018, March 2018. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, we, we have Chloe, who is an A legend and a student of ours, asking, how did you get influencing support from others, government, social enterprises, etc., to make bigger and strong to make a bigger and stronger community? How do how do you find it? What, what have you found mo most challenging so far as well? Yeah, so I haven't got any support from any kind of social on enterprises, governments, etc. Um, when I initially launched, I kind of chatted to a couple of people and they just said in retail, there's no real grants available um, with what I was doing. So that was a pretty like quick shut, close of the door or move on for me. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't get any support like that from them. But in saying that, I'm now working with a lot of local councils and educating people. So it's not grants per se, I'm paid by them to come in and present a talk on how to live without plastic or how to compost at home and things like that. So that's probably the most that I get involved with them. Um, and the most challenging thing that I found in the journey so far is I want to be at the next level. I want to be in a team of 10 people. I want to be walking into an office that has a warehouse downstairs and a social media studio and a podcast studio, and I want it all. Um, so I get frustrated because I want it to be happening right now, but I think that's probably, that's just time. It's just putting it in and it's just kind of putting one foot in front of the other and to keep pushing and driving. Awesome. That's really nice. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to Thais and then I'm going to go back to the second. Oh, oh, Renata, you had another question about transitioning from corporate to business, to your own business. But before that one, I would like to ask you, uh, because you were just touching upon that subject, which is how do you sell your corporate your educational products? That's that's a question from Thais. Uh, is it B2B? Do you do it online as well? Do you just walk? This is more of a personalized thing. And then it, obviously without telling us, but what is your revenue balance between this educational programs and your retail? Yeah, so this is a tricky one. I have always had really diverse revenue streams and it's something that one of my mentors has kind of drummed into me from the get-go was about never putting your eggs in one basket and really trying to kind of diversify because especially if you rely so heavily on social media like I do, I can't rely on Facebook or Instagram because they change their algorithm and then I'm completely gone. So it has always been about kind of having your fingers in a couple of different pies. So the way that we make money on Vanish is we sell products. Then we also do it through COVID. I launched the Waste Less Workbook, which is an online educational tool and it's kind of like got an assessment tool, but then also an educational resource. So we sell that B to C, but then we also do sell that B to B. So have kind of a corporate organization will order like 30 of them for their workplace and their workplace for say national recycling week will get a workbook each. So that's, um, also there and then I also do sell the educational programs like I just mentioned with the councils but again I don't probably with the educational programs I put that more under me personally rather than me as banished so that's where it gets a little bit tricky because there is kind of two personas there there is the banish and then there is Lottie and I think Lottie then goes and talks to councils and goes to talk about composting but when I'm there talking about composting I want people to compost better and recycle more 
I don't want to sell them a compost bin that I sell on Banish. So I have to kind of almost separate myself and sit as a different business, especially because from a council's perspective, they wouldn't like Banish as a retail store. So why would they get a retail store and pay a retail store to talk to them about composting? So that's why I do separate it. Um, and so then that's a whole nother side of things is the whole corporate education sphere. So that, is a big part of kind of what I do. It was huge at the start of the year, but because of COVID, again, it just got completely shut down because there were no events anymore. Nobody wanted to do in-person talks because none of their staff were in person. So I was able to keep my biggest client and we launched a podcast off the back of that. So that is a portion of the, like that is now a part of my income, but it's allowed me to really focus on growing the revenue from an e-commerce perspective. That's awesome. That's really, really good. Um, so I, I am going to go back to Renata's question, which was how was that transition between working corporate and then no longer having a salary and, and being all on your, like all on your own and just there kind of giving it a go from yeah, scratch. It was pretty scary. Um, I, quit my full-time job within nine months which is quite early and I probably wouldn't recommend it but my job was so demanding I had a team of seven people I couldn't I tried to kind of talk to my boss and say I'll just do like four days a week and then I'll do three days a week and he just kind of laughed at me and he said you know you won't be able to do that. So it really put me in a position where I had to choose and it kind of got to a, just a crunch point where I had to make the decision whether I would pursue Banish or whether I would continue working in the corporate job because I wasn't fit. it wasn't sustainable for me as an individual to keep on juggling both. I continued with my 4 a.m. wake-ups for that nine months in order to kind of do as much as I could. But in order to grow Banish, it was really sweat equity that I needed more than anything. And that's what it came down to. But I was lucky because I was able to freelance as a writer for those first couple of months. So when I did take the plunge, I wasn't then relying solely on Banish. So I was then able to kind of write and produce articles on the side for the next 12 months to kind of continue. It wasn't enough. It wasn't an equal salary to what I was getting in a corporate job, but enough to kind of pay rent and allow me to really focus on Banish. That's incredible. That's an incredible story. And then the last, uh, the last question here from the chat, and then I'll, I'll let everyone who wants to just ask a question to just go on and uh, put their cameras on or unmute themselves. Why, why am I so dark? This is, there we go. Okay. It's, um, Gerardo is asking about the packaging. Do you have any packaging there to show us maybe around you? Are your providers the ones that do the packaging of the products? Yeah, or, so, or do you... yeah, so most of my um, suppliers, it's a drop shipping model banishes. So most of the suppliers send out the products directly to the customer. Um, in saying that, there are a couple of um, suppliers that I then send out myself, but it is really difficult. There can be no plastic, so there can be no bubble wrap. There can be no none of the Australia Post shipping satchels, which until I think it was maybe, I think it was six months ago, it was actually more expensive to take your own packaging to Australia Post and to get them to put a little baby sticker on top of it. So every single order that I posted was more expensive purely because I was using paper and my own packaging instead of an Australia Post satchel. So that's kind of, that's an example of the economic challenges of running a sustainable business is that things like that, when a, when a customer gets that your order, they go, great, it's in paper, but they don't really think that all I actually had to pay. It was upwards of kind of two or $3 per order that I would have to pay extra in order for it to be shipped without, without plastic. Um, another one is sticky tape. So we don't allow any sticky tape on any of the orders as well. So there is craft paper tape that people use, or you can also use water activated tape. Um, 
the compostable shipping satchels I have a love-hate relationship with. I think they're great because they're a really good alternative if you've got a compost bin at home. But I think the percentage of people in Australia that have compost bins is a lot lower than we actually think. So in some cases, I really do just think it's brands being able to kind of go, great, we've got compostable shipping satchels. We're not using plastic anymore. Whereas we're in actual fact sending that compostable shipping satchel to landfill is the equivalent of putting a banana peel in there it's just going to create greenhouse gases as well um, and then if anything is fragile we also use corn peanuts or like little baby squishy pellets which can be broken down in water or you can also pop them in your compost bin that's awesome that's really really good um, and i'm going to take the lead and ask another question that i was just thinking of how do you how do you care for your customer experience when you're not dealing with any other shippings or i mean uh, when it's a drop shipping business and, and 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 to share with everyone because maybe not everyone knows what a drop shipping business means but that means that basically you are some sort of a middleman between the order and the actual supplier so uh it's not that you're touching the package at any given point it just flows without you even knowing it's happening so how do you handle that that um stu like a uh, student i was gonna say but that that um customer experience so that they would come back and, and buy again and do you have a metric of what's your uh retention rate or or the people that come back and shop from banish once they've shopped for the first time yeah so our returning customer rate is really high it's up at the moment it's about 37 percent which i think is pretty good um yes. but it is really difficult. It's all about the communication because as a customer as well, there aren't a lot of drop shipping websites in Australia. So it can be a little bit confusing for them. It took me a while again, getting it perfect was when, so now when you get, when you place an order, say you've ordered five products from three different suppliers. So you'll get three different packages as a, that customer. So when you get an email, your email confirmation says like, hey, Christmas has come early. You're actually going to get three parcels for this. So it's giving them that heads up. It's letting them know early. Then when they get their first one, it goes one of three parcels is on its way to you. So it's very transparent. It's very clear. I do still get customers who send me a message saying, hey, half of my order arrived today. Not sure. Like, I think you forgot to put in X, Y, and Z. And then I just have to explain to them again, like, oh no, like, as you can see on your shipping, like on your tracking document, like it's coming. And also that's a thing when they do go and view their order after kind of a couple of items has been shipped, it does bunch them together. So it'll say, blah, blah, blah is coming via Australia Post, blah, blah, blah is coming via Sendal, I don't know. So it is very clear for them, but it did again it was a bit of a headache at the start but now it's fine um in terms with my suppliers sticking to the strict plastic free shipping guidelines um i was really fortunate because at the start it was hard for me to find people that were doing this and often it would take them say okay for your orders we won't put it in australia post satchel whereas i'm really fortunate now that when i talk to people about my strict shipping they kind of go oh yeah that's fine we do that anyway so that's mm -hmm. easy so that's good that's for great. them so i think that's been really handy as part of the application process they need to send me an image of what an order looks like again so i can actually see how that goes and then when a new supplier is onboarded, we've got about, I think we've got over 50 now, they get sent a welcome pack. And in that welcome pack is a set of Banish compostable stickers and a set of thank you cards that are Banish branded. So in every single Banish order, a thank you card goes in it and a compostable sticker goes on the outside. And that's been really, really important to communicate with them because if the customer has a problem, they can't go to them they need to come to me and that because they've paid me so they really need to kind of work that out so again i had a couple of hiccups a couple of like people sending all of their paraphernalia and kind of refer a friend share us on social media tag this other brand not banish but it wasn't until i kind of sent this welcome pack which is all like zhuzhi and all like we love you you're a part of the family welcome that they understood the concept so it's about i think 
you can't assume you just really have to make it so so easy and so simple that's incredible that is that is really that's unbelievable lori thank you so much uh we are on time but uh does anyone want to ask uh, another question feel free to do it now or forever stay muted I'm going to give you guys a few seconds. And if not, we'll just say thank you to Lori for her time. Anyone can DM me on Instagram or email me as well if they want to. Awesome. Definitely do so. I'm assuming yeah. nobody else uh, wants to ask a question. Uh, AMD says, thank you so much. I say thank you so much. I see Renata clapping her hands uh, <laughs> as well. So, uh, Lori, thank you no, very, for very much me. for this beautiful hour there was some incredible insights especially for for many starting or aspiring entrepreneurs and, and and getting a grip of how hard it is and and what it really takes to do this leap or take this leap so um i wish we can see you at some point again have you live maybe at our campus or if not just once again here online maybe in a few weeks yeah, or months i would love that uh, guys, thanks for coming. Uh, stay tuned. We have more incredible events coming in the next few weeks. There's a lot of congrats and thank yous going on in the chat. And uh, I'll, I'll start, I'll, I'll stop now streaming. I'll stop recording. And I wish you all the very best of weeks and uh, hope to see you all very soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>